Welcome back, everyone. This segment is sponsored by Mr. J's Havana Smoke Shop. Located here in Rhode Island, they have an outstanding selection of premium handmade cigars. You can visit them online at mrjhavana.com. Welcome back, everyone, to the Stogie Geek Show. We're happy to announce that we have our special guest on the lines via Skype this evening. None other than Robert Caldwell is joining us. Welcome, Robert. Thank you. Thank you Welcome for having back me. to the show. You were yeah, actually- you know what? Thank you for reminding me because the music made me remember. We did this a few years ago, um, and I completely forgot that with Winwood. But then the music just reminded me. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. I, th- I think he would, you were technically the first Stogie Geeks live guest. I think That's so. Yep. Yeah, at a store in Rhode Island also, I believe, uh, that was upstairs. Yeah, right next door to us. All right. We have a studio yeah. now, actually, next door to where we recorded that oh, segment. Oh, that's awesome. So, yeah. Um, so, Robert, um, tell us about your journey after uh, Wynwood. Um, shit. Well, where to begin, I guess. So, obviously, I had a, uh, a bit of a falling out with my business partner, which led to the... Um, termination of the project on my end, which shortly thereafter led to the kind of termination of the project on his end. And um, so, I mean, immediately I, 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 right out of the gates, I actually wasn't sure what I wanted to do because I wanted to take a little bit of a breather and then try to figure out what I was going to do. I've never had a job. I've always been a self-employed entrepreneur type. So I kind of took a step back for a minute and uh, I started getting some offers to be kind of like a a face, I guess, uh, a licensed type person, which I thought was really cool because it was money and it was something that was very easy to do. And then uh, within a few days, I don't know, I just started kind of having that pull that I felt like I had a lot of unfinished business. So, you know, obviously Wynwood um, was something that I took very seriously, put a lot of energy, money, time into, and I, and I had a lot of kind of unclosed doors and it left a lot on the table with, with that project. And so Caldwell, the cigar company, it became very quickly kind of like the next the next generation of that so i mean we we incorporate art we incorporate all that shit you know and one of the things with winwood that i always wanted to do was just get very rare very special tobaccos uh i've always had kind of a love affair with dominican tobacco nothing else just the tobacco um and uh and so that was kind of like my next step so i i went down to dr started kind of tinkering Still not knowing what I was going to do because a lot of the, the arrangements that I was offered would allow me to manufacture independent of whoever I was working with in whatever factory I wanted. So I went down right away and started kind of playing with some stuff. And uh, I mean, the path was kind of just, it was weird. It was like, there's the glowing light, you just follow it. And very quickly, everything fell into place. And what a lot of people don't realize is from the time that I left Wynwood until the time that Call a Cigar Company was launched was I think only four months and the time we had product on shelves was four months after that. So it was eight months from closing doors or terminating a relationship to, to being back on the store shelves with a new brand. So it was a very intense, ridiculous, tremendously trying, difficult, you know, fingers crossed, white knuckle type of experience for me and for, for the guys that I work with. Um, and then, you know, it took us, I guess, a couple of months to realize we kind of had a little bit of footing and then we started to crawl and then we started to walk. So it was a, it was a really cool, I would never fucking do it again. I've done it twice in three years. And so, I mean, this year I slept at home 34 nights the year prior, I think was 47. Um, if I did it again, I dropped dead. So, well, well you, Robert, you love this industry. I could tell you just really, you, you know, you're like a stogie geek in a lot of what you just, I, you know. I could see it with you. Yeah, you know, it's like that girlfriend that you can't ever break up with, you know? <laughs> the one that, you know, you break up with her and then, and then, you know, you start having like Friday night movie struggle snuggle type situations and then you're right back in it. So, <laughs> I think, for you me, know, it's, that would be an awesome name for a cigar, the struggle, struggle snuggle. snuggle. Yeah, it's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> that, there's, that and surprise sex. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, you know, for me, it's something that I can't get away from. I always say, I mean, I'm, I'm not good at many things. And I, I mean, I'm not good at a lot of things, but I'm good at some things. And so tobacco happens to be something that falls into a category of things that I'm good at. That I'm So I'm good at presenting it. I'm good at marketing it. I'm good at developing concepts. I'm good at these things. So it, it's, it's one of the few options that I have. But then so the cool thing is I kind of realized that and I've been in the industry for a while. 
but it kind of led me. So people are always like, oh, what are you doing next? Or, you know, a lot of talk people within the industry, all we do is tobacco, you know, not really. But so then the rest of the world, they do other things. So, you know, my family, my friends, my, my business associates, you know, what's the next step? And it's like, hey, fuck it. Let's do olive oil or let's do something ridiculous that is uh, something that's antiquated, like cigars, something that has a general packaging that everybody abides by, like cigars and these types of things and just rework it. So it's cool because tobacco for me has opened doors to the rest of my life. You know, I want to make cigars forever, but you want to do other things. And then I don't want to make fucking jewelry you know i love matt booth i love these guys that do it that's their thing that's not my thing but so it's given me it's it's really weird it kind of grew me up as a person so you know i'm a fucking i'm a drug addict a lot of people know that i'm an alcoholic i quit when i was 19 so 13 years ago i haven't done anything dropped out of college i've always been a very uh, you know i was a straight a honorable dean's list drug addict athlete dropout <laughs> so i was kind of covered every base at once but so you know I never really knew what I was doing. So I became an entrepreneur, you know, it's like, I can't, you know, so I hustled and then I kind of found my way, but I never knew what I was doing until I found cigars. And when I found cigars, I said, aha, I'm good at this. I'm good at this. And it, and it developed me as a person to where now I'm 32 going on 33 years old. And it educated me because I had to learn how to do these things to market and develop a brand and sell a brand and put a team together and build a business. So it, it was like my MBA was cigars, you know? So it's a really weird thing because it's something that has absolutely given my life meaning. And if I could never make another cigar, I would still land on my feet because I could apply everything that I've learned from doing cigars and take them into other categories of <laughs> goods and kind of repeat the concept, which is very cool. So it's, a, it's been, to me, not an education on... I got a fucking giant dog over here knocking things down. It's been not an education. <laughs> Look at this thing. She's like a baby great thing. <laughs> Maxine, come here. Don't say hi. I was wondering what that Peace. noise was in the background. Some, some pain in the ass. But so, but so it's actually it's been really cool because it, it kind of grew me up in life. And somewhere in the last year, I kind of said to myself, okay, you know, if people are scared of FDA. They're scared of you know, smoking bands, they're, you know, they're scared of tobacco beetles, they're scared of things that knock you out of the industry. Because somebody once said to me, tobacco is the only thing that you love that hates you back, mm -hmm. like consistently. Bugs, mold, tastes bad, dries out, doesn't burn, like it wants to defeat you as, as a manufacturer and you love it. So, we, you know, and then you have FDA and you have smoking bands, you have all these things trying to bump you out of what you love. But so the cool thing with me was that it gave, it's given to me much more than a cigar. It's given to me like kind of a path in life and an understanding of myself to where now I know what I'm good at because of that, if that makes sense. So, uh, Robert, one of the decisions you made uh, in creating Caldwell was to use uh, the Dominican Republic and Tobacco Lera Ventura. Tell us about that, that decision. So... The Venturas, uh, for those that don't know, William Ventura was the original blender for Davidoff, and then he became the quality control manager and the manager of managers. He was the, he, he like, you know, he, there's a problem with a Davidoff anniversary number three in Nairobi, and William's on a plane to check that, that certain batch of cigars. That was kind of his job. And he implemented a lot of the quality control measures that they use. He has a lot of friends. A lot of people want to see him succeed. Makes great cigars, good price, family business. So... I was introduced to him by, uh, by actually Davidoff years ago before I got into the industry as deep as I am. I started making cigars for restaurants and hotels. And then so I was talking to Davidoff and Camacho about making some stuff. And they pointed me in his direction for Dominican because the, the, the stuff from Davidoff was going to be too difficult to work uh, with them. Just, you know, six month problem, you know, six months to make a cigar and expensive things and these things. So they kind of pointed me in their direction. So William... Um, it's funny because when I'm when I met William, he makes amazing cigars and he's a great blender, but he blends in a very particular way. So I chose William because of the quality of construction that they have. And again, he implements the principles that he learned and that he developed into his current um, business. And so I wanted to go to DR because DR was the first country to really cultivate cigar tobacco. They were, they beat, dog, they beat Cuba to the table. Cuba Cuba was making coffee and sugar. And DR was making tobacco. And so you have a, you have a, 
five times more variety of seed coming out of Dominican Republic than you have of anywhere else. And if you combined everywhere else, it probably still wouldn't come to half of what DR makes in terms of varietal. So to me, as kind of like a, a gourmet type of person, and I, you know, I get sick of smoking the same thing over and over again, that's the outlet that I've always reached to. Even with Winwood, I was wanting to use these tobaccos to make special things. So I said, okay, I have a great manufacturer. That's, that's a guy that I respect, you know, have come to love, awesome family, does things right. And then I have a country that, that gives me the world when it comes to tobacco options. And then so just kind of put the two together and we started production with them. The fun thing is that my style of what I like to smoke and what I blend and William's style are very different. So I enjoy what he makes, but he's had to learn how to enjoy what I make. And it's funny because the world has progressed in a way that he's still very much old school. This is this is what a cigar is supposed to taste like. And he hasn't followed the the curve. So originally I give him my cigars. Eastern Standard, he loves. King is dead, long live the king. He's like, these are disgusting. He hated them. <laughs> but but then he's constantly tasting them and smoking them for the quality control. And now he's like, man, I love these cigars. So it's been a really cool experience for him, too. Yesterday, he's smoking a King is Dead Lonsdale. And he's like, I love this cigar. But it took him 10 cigars to appreciate it. So it's been a really cool uh, opportunity to work with him because we both have kind of, I think, affected each other very much. Robert, what's your dog's name? Her name is Maxime with an M. Maxime. French hooker name. Unless you're named Maxime and you're listening to this. <laughs> so, uh, she, she's got like four of my shoes. <laughs> oh, that's she's, 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 she's a beast. She's amazing. I just got her. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, I, travel, I take my, my, my dogs come into the studio here because this is where I work from every day. It's my studio in my office. So I, I have pugs. I take, mm -hmm. I take them in here in the studio. It's great. Yeah, she's amazing. The problem is I'm, I travel 10 months a year, but I have a, a live-in lady friend, so she takes care of her. My, my, my girlfriend does, but it's worth it for the day every other week that I get to play with her. You know? Yeah, I find there's a high overlap between uh, people who love dogs and people who love cigars because I take my dogs where they, I go to the cigar lounge next door, you know, say hi, get ice, get coffee or whatever. Uh, they follow me in there, and they greet everyone, and everyone is, like, so happy to see my dog. So I, I think it's really cool. It's kind of – it says something about the personality of cigar smokers, you know? Yeah, I agree with that. Um, so tell us about the two lines, uh, the Caldwell Collection and the Junior Varsity. So we have two lines. Uh, Caldwell is the premium – selection what i mean by premium isn't is, there's not a huge difference in the tobacco hold on let me kill this dog hey come here come here there's not a, there's they have different grades of tobacco so there's grade a grade b grade c grade a is the best of the best of the best of the best that's what we use in caldwell so that's one of the elements of caldwell the other thing with caldwell the kind of the idea was to use special rare tobacco so we use very special rare tobaccos in caldwell so one of which is the king is dead is one of the caldwell line the wrapper is called Negrito. It also has Negrito tobacco inside of it. That's a tobacco that was very famous about 50 years ago. And they stopped cultivating it in DR. And recently they started recultivating that tobacco in the early 2000s. Uh, that's a project I've been working on for seven years. I started making that cigar for the Rich Carlton. Um, or working with that tobacco. And uh, then I wanted to implement it in Wynwood. We never did. So I've kind of been going back and forth with that cigar for a very long time. It's not seven years of blending to make a good cigar that, that took so long. It was that, that, I always say that tobacco doesn't play well with others. It doesn't blend and it doesn't burn. Hmm. So to get it to blend and burn was a, a very long ordeal. And then finally we got it to where it blends and burns most of the time. Um, but so that's a fantastic cigar. A lot of people smoke it and they're not sure what they think about it. It's a weird thing. So it's, it's something that some guys get it right away. Some guys it's an acquired taste. And it's something that I always tell people, look, whether or not you like it, appreciate it, understand it, because it's something that's kind of hard to grasp when it comes to your palate. So that's King is Dead. Uh, that's one of the Caldwell lines. The other one, Long Live the King, it's a, uh, a non-hybridized Corojo wrapper that's coming out of Dominican Republic. Uh, Camacho's fame comes out of their Corojo wrapper, which is, they call it authentic Corojo with a little trademark logo next to it, so we can't say that. But mm -hmm. it's a, also non-hybridized Corojo that, can't, that comes out of, of Honduras. So what a lot of people also don't know is that Central America, particularly Hamastran Valley of Honduras, was one of the few pl places that was immune to this mold that came in the late 90s, early 2000s, wiped out a lot of tobacco. 
Corojo tobacco in particular is very prone to this mold. So when they had these issues, there were very few places that were spared. Most people switched to a hybridized Corojo leaf and started growing a hybridized Corojo, which tastes just like Corojo, except it's very watered down in flavor. So when you smoke Camacho, whether or not you like them, I like them, um, you'll taste a very unique flavor with their Corojo tobaccos. So when I was in DR, actually the same place where I acquired my, my uh, Negrito leaf, the guy had unhybridized Corojo. And I said, how is this possible? He's like, oh, I grow five acres of it. Oh, not a so, lot, but wait, it's I'm sorry, Robert. Uh, ex back up. Explain the difference between hybridized and non-hybridized Dominican tobacco. What does that mean? Hybridized been hybridized. Non-hybridized been not hybridized. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so, so much for clearing so that So what up. they did, I mean, effectively, they hybridized the leaf. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure exactly what what, but to create a, a seed that would then give you a Corojo flavor but have immunity to mold. And so what right. that did was it gave you a very much, I, I always explain it like you have scotch and you have scotch with a splash. Scotch with a splash is hybridized Corojo. Scotch is non-hybridized Corojo. Corojo tobacco. Now, now, so back to those tobaccos. So Honduras is the leader of, of, of authentic non-hybridized Corojo. Mm -hmm. The problem that I had always with Central American Corojo, which I used in Wynwood, was that it didn't blend that well. Um, it amazing tobacco but uh, the, the front of your palate was always corojo and so if you yeah. blended it with tobaccos like we did we put it with a nicaraguan seco and we put it with a pelo de oro and we put it with some other things with winwood you would taste varying levels of the same thing so the experience mm. was very monotonous from cigar to cigar you'd have a full body flavor that was very similar to your medium to your more mild flavor of corojo regardless of what we blended it with so I was very against working with Corojo when I got down to DR and I started playing with stuff. And this grower just kept insisting that I, that I try this Corojo. And I'm like, look, I mean, oh, my Corojo is not hybridized. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I sold that story before. I don't care. <laughs> so then he made me a cigar. Or a pachuche, it's called. It's just a little rolled up shit that you smoke and you taste it. And I said, man, oh, I just got a text from Dylan Austin from Camacho Cigars. Fuck you. It blends well. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> that's not what I meant, Dylan. I meant it. I'm waiting for the next text. It blends very well. The point is that to me, to my palate, which is very unsophisticated <laughs> compared to the people who are texting me, is that I felt, okay, so back to my story. So a guy puts a damn cigar in front of me. I'm like, okay, this is interesting. So when I smoked it and when we started blending it, I noticed that I, that I could taste more of the other yeah, fuck you too, Dylan. I, I could taste more <laughs> of the other tobaccos that I blended inside of it. So it's funny because if you look at my Winwood and you look at my Long Live the King, it's almost the same blend. Slightly different. Very slightly different. It's a blend that I actually made uh, very similar for, for, for a very good friend and customer of mine for his store. So I'm like, all right, let me play with this blend. So I started playing with the blend. I said, man, I can taste that. I can taste the sweetness of the Pelo de Oro so much more. Mm. The cigar is creamier. I can taste that Habano, the creaminess that's coming from the Habano Seco. So I noticed that the, that the Dominican Corojo allowed the other flavors that were in the cigar to stand out more. Yeah, I know that and makes the, sense. And the Corojo took a little bit of a backseat. So I got put onto that one. The last cigar is called Eastern Standard. Um, Eastern Standard is just a beast. I mean... It started out as our slowest seller. It, it's picked up, and it's definitely, uh, I mean, it's, I think it's, it's taking strides of, uh, uh, in, in front of our other cigars right now. That, that, tobacco, that cigar, the, the featured tobacco, and forgive me for being short, but I'm long-winded and trying to get through this, but it's a hybridized Connecticut shade with Arapiraca. So it's not a true uh, Connecticut leaf. I, wanted, I actually didn't want to have that cigar in the portfolio because I thought, okay, I don't want to come out with too many cigars at once. I don't want to come out with you know, something mild, but it's a very big twist on Connecticut. And, and I said, ha, maybe I can call it hybridized Connecticut. And people will think, let me try this thing. So the response has been amazing because a lot of Connecticut smokers like it. It's a little bit richer, a little bit stronger than Connecticut. A lot of fuller body guys like it too, because the richness and the kind of body and complexity that it has compels somebody who likes a fuller body smoke. So we were able to grab a lot of the market that we didn't think we were going to get. We thought we were going to get the guys to smoke light things. So that was very special. And that cigar, I have to give, you know, Long Live King Eastern Stand or Long Live King King is dead. I can grab my thing and say, okay, you know what? I did that. Uh, Eastern Standard's a different story. Eastern Standard, uh, William Ventura, he's a man of finesse, and he's like just 
you know, you fly back to the States, white boy, and let me deal with this thing for a while. So <laughs> we got kind of the frame of the house built and he did everything else. And he just, he labored a long time perfecting that blend for me. And to me, take it or leave it. I love that cigar. I smoke, I just, I, I cannot stop smoking that cigar. So, so that's the Caldwell collection. So again, very special tobaccos, things that aren't readily available or, or are hard to get and so forth. So we use what we consider to be, and I think other people that understand our tobaccos, things that are very special in nature. They're all grade A tobacco. They're cosmetically, physically, structurally the best tobacco that money can buy. They're fermented very properly um, and they're aged to perfection. So we, a lot of energy goes in that cigar. The JV selection, very quickly, we have Sevillana, Murcia, and Gibraltar, three different cigars. Those are cigars that the Venturas made and were marketing in Dominican Republic that we would enjoy when we'd go down there. Ter terrible packaging. Sorry, Venturas, if you're listening. Um, and they had, like, Lonsdale. They had, uh, you know, like, whatever, Lancero, a petite Corona-ish thing, a Perla. They had some sizes that you cannot sell in the States. People aren't going to buy it. You launch a brand with four lines, they all have a 43 or lower ring gauge. The guys don't buy it. So we said, these are great cigars. Let's, let's take these cigars rework them a little bit, repackage them, change the sizes and see what we can do. So that's the JV selection. So you have a Connecticut, a Habano and a San Andres Maduro. Those go from 460 to 690. Nice. Very uh, price conscious cigars. And they're great, great, great cigars. We get shitloads of complaints. Today I'm trying to sell it to a guy <coughs> that sells the hell out of Colo. And I said, uh, you know, why don't you buy some of this shit? Because today's my last day of the year and I wanted to hit a number, which I did hit, thank God. But um, I was really pushing, you know, and so he's like, you know, I'm like, look, I'll give you a deal. I'll give you, buy a hundred boxes. I'll give you one free. That's a Caldwell special. Mm -hmm. And so <laughs> the guy's like, the guy's like, I love your cigars. I love the JV, but I won't buy them. And I said, why won't you buy them? He said, it's too good of a cigar for $5. I said, that that's, makes no sense. And he said, look, I, I'd rather sell a $7 cigar that's just as good than your $5 cigar. And I said, Okay, I get your business. So we do have a little bit of an uphill battle with those brands because mm -hmm. people don't understand. They think JV, they think Caldwell second, or they think something that isn't as good. They're great cigars. They're just they're made in a more cost efficient way. Uh, we use readily available tobaccos. They're not as well aged. Um, we don't we don't color sort them or anything like that. We just roll them, pack them, ship them. Um, but we do have much less exposure with the JV lines. The Caldwell stuff is the stuff that's roaring, which is great. But we expected the JV to pick up most of the, the weight of the brands and the Caldwell would be our crown jewel. And it's turned out that the Caldwell is the, the workhorse and the crown jewel at the same time. Robert, how do, you, how do you come up with the names for your cigars? That's a very good question. Um, Murcia, Gibraltar, and Sevillana are very easy to explain. So Spain was the first country to commercialize cigar production and standardize practice. The first factory was in Sevilla. Cigars came through Gibraltar and Murcia, the two ports. Very easy. So everybody that's classic Cuban, we did classic Spanish. Mm -hmm. um, again, because to pay homage to DR, DR was the first right. country to cultivate. So the first country to manufacture was Spain. So we didn't want to come out with a classic Cuban thing. We came out with a classic Spanish thing. The Caldwell collection is more tricky. Did you get that? Yes. Okay. So there's 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 some innuendo tied in. There's some uh, some dick grab. There's a little bit of stab you in the side. There's a little bit of wordplay. There's a lot of things mixed into those cigars. Uh, but the, the, so you can feast on that later. But the, the idea was King is Dead, Long Live the King. King is Dead is so fucking good that the minute it's out, got to light Long Live the King. And that was kind of the idea that we had was originally to market cigars that you smoke back to back. And so sometimes you smoke a cigar and it's good. Very good. Sometimes you smoke a cigar after it and the second cigar tastes better because you smoked the first cigar. I'm sure you guys have noticed that. Mm -hmm. So the idea was to, to create cigars that were very complimentary that you could smoke back to back. So when the king would die, long live the king, the little child is now king. So that was, that was kind of a marketing angle for it. Try selling that to a fucking store. <laughs> They're like, wait a minute. So I have to buy this and I have to sell this and they have to smoke this. It, it didn't work. So we just let the names run and they took their course. Eastern Standard, I had the blend done. I was going to launch it a year into being in business if everything went well. Uh, I was at a bar in South Beach. I was looking at a cocktail menu. They had a drink called Eastern Standard. I was like, that's a fucking cool name. 
Walk downstairs, come out of the bathroom. There was a big glowing sign that said Live East, Die Young, which is also on the label. <laughs> and it was a sign from somewhere that this was my brand. And then so I said, OK, I got my catchphrase, Live East, Die Young, and I have Eastern Standard. And I thought it was a great combination and I thought it worked for the cigar. Love the cigar. So I said, fuck it. Let's do it. And nothing you ever heard of project. Is that a, mm. is that a cigar? Is that a project? Should I've that's heard? a cigar. That's a cigar that ships Monday. Should I have heard um, of it? You should not have heard of it. The, okay. the name is The Last Czar with an S. Tassar, not Czar with a CZ. Um, so that is a cigar that ships Monday. That's another fun project. So we did a limited edition. We released it to 49 retailers. It was our, We had a lot of kind of... We wanted to reward uh, our, our first supporting stores. We've gotten a lot bigger than we were uh, eight, nine months ago, but... Coming to the trade show, we had 79 stores, 75. Coming out of the trade show, we had like 130 or 50 or whatever, 180. I don't know. Now we have like almost 400. So we've grown a lot. So what do you do to reward people that, that were with you from the beginning and still support you? And so that was the idea behind Last Czar. So we have something that we came up with, a little elimination system. You had to be with us before the show. You had to be with us after the show. You had to pay a place an order before and after, and you had to purchase a certain amount of casings and this type of thing. So we came up with... <laughs> That's ridiculous. She just loves to knock shit over. So <laughs> but you had to come, you had to, you, had to, you had to show a certain amount of support. Nobody knew it was coming. And then it was going to be a select product that was only available to these guys. So it's a very special cigar. It has the same wrapper as Eastern Standard, uh, identical, except that it was, it was fermented more it was processed a little bit differently, and so it's a Arapiraca Connecticut Shade Hybrid Maduro wrapper. So it's a very unique wrapper, pain in the ass um, to make. We lost a ton of tobacco when making it because it was a, a more of an experiment than anything to, to use that wrapper in that way. And um, we, we included some other tobaccos, one of which is Carbonell, uh, really cool tobacco, very kind of like incense type of aroma to it. Um, and, and, and the cool thing... We hit a cigar. We have a cigar that's full in body, creamy, smooth, rich as hell, and it's salty. It's salty. It tastes salty. So, so it turned out to be this dynamic cigar that I don't particularly like because I think it's too strong for my palate. But guys that have smoked it have just gone really wild for it. So we got 500 boxes of that shipping starting next week, um, and that's our first limited. So we'll be releasing that twice a year. Um, we might cool. rotate the blend or we might – Keep the blend the same. We're not quite sure yet. So now, what's the what's the yellow cake cigar? Yellow cake. Hold on one second. I'll show you what my dog grabbed. She got cigars. Yellow cake is a uh, yellow cake. Actually, it's funny because this cigar got a ton of hype, and then guys all the time they'll email me. They're like, "I just paid forty dollars for a three pack of yellow cake. They're not as good as I thought they'd be for forty dollars." And I'm like, "We give them away for free. You're not supposed to pay for them because they're not good enough to buy." Right. <laughs> I'm not. I'm, and I, it and I'm not exaggerating. How, it is funny how people will chase cigars. I mean, I, I chase cigars sometimes too, and it is funny how that works. Yeah, it's it's an unfortunate thing because the it's funny because I mean that cigar blew up bigger than Caldwell did. You know, like on social media, it's crazy. So we were hit. We we've 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 been in business for exactly 12 months. We've spent five months and 15 days on back. Or excuse me, six months and 15 days on back order. We've been on back order more than we've been shipping. And we're lucky we're still in business for that. But we've, we've had tremendous issues with, with production. Um, we grew way faster, way bigger than we thought we would be, you know, during those points in time. We order, now we're ordering 100,000 cigars a month, which is a tremendous amount of cigars. We sell them faster than we can make them. So what do you do? You go to an event, you do buy three, get one free, and I give you a cigar that I could sell to Joe. Bad business. So we said, okay, what can we do? We have all these great trimmings. Let's make a mixed filler cigar. So we made a Cuban sandwich style cigar. It's got a, so it's, it's got the, the, the king is dead. Fucking dog. It's got the king is dead, <laughs> dead and, the, uh, and the Eastern Standard uh, trimmings mixed in with a long live the king filler, a long live the king binder, and a long live the king wrapper. And the idea was I can give you three cigars, three cigars, for around the same amount of money that it cost me to give you a long live the king Corona. 
So it's good business for us. We weren't wasting our, our stuff. We had great scrap that we wanted to use, and we could give you a three-pack for the winter time that you could smoke when you're freezing your ass off, and it takes 20 minutes. So that was the concept. It was like to not waste, come out with something cool, um, to utilize our scrap, to give you a small cigar for the winter time, and to not give away shit that we should be selling or filling shelf with. It got blown way out of proportion because guys... Guys could only get it at events, and uh, and we weren't doing many events in the winter, so it became a thing, you know. So that's Yellow King. I mean, it's a great cigar. It's not blended. It's not balanced. It's a good smoke, but that's that's what it is, you know. And the unfortunate thing is that people are paying money for these things. You pay five, ten bucks for a pack. I think that's all right, but I mean, it's usurious to pay to pay money for them, and and so it's for that very reason that we don't sell them. And a lot of people are like, oh, you know, why don't you sell these things? And I'm like, I don't want to sell them. I want to give them away. So that's yellow cake. Yeah. Go ahead, Will. Rob. Robert, I got a question here. Um, lawyer or the rodeo clown? Rodeo clown. <laughs> that was a question from someone in our audience. Nice. That was that was that, I know exactly. That was Dylan Austin. <laughs> that was somebody from the Davidoff team. Oh, I told, wait a minute. Wait a minute. That was Dil, That was George Romney. That was George <laughs> Romney or Dylan Austin. Uh. It was Dylan. I knew it. Rodeo clown, always. Rodeo. D Dylan can tell the story. Is he actually there physically? No, he's not. He's, he's obviously tuned in. Mm. Dylan's a Rodeo cool cat, clown. man. He's been a good friend. Dylan is the best, best, best marketer, in my opinion, that this industry has and has ever had. What a job he did um, with Camacho. He's what, a fucking what a animal. Job. Yeah. He's a That's fucking real. animal. He's yeah. underpaid, too. Davidoff should give him more money. I don't know if somebody from Davidoff is listening. No, Dylan, you know, Dylan actually, Dylan's been a, 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 a good friend of mine, great friend of mine over the years. He's been a support structure. He's been a, a cheerleader, a promoter. He's been a lot of things to me, uh, you know, as, as well as being a friend. But I can tell you that that guy is hands-on. You know, I do a lot of design-type shit, right? And I work with a lot of artists, and I work with a lot of designers. A lot of people think that's what Dylan do, does. Dylan does everything and he's tremendously talented at everything that he does and i think i think that guy's a, like, an asset that davidoff very well knows um what they have with him but i think that he's just you know a phenomenal guy in, in every sense and and for professionally speaking i i i can't i can't, I can't fathom what he does yeah you know? robert having said that uh talking about artwork i know the the winwood the last time you were on you talked about the artwork that went into the packaging you have um very uh unique packaging uh for your new line as well Mm -hmm. How did that? How did that come about? What was your approach to get the the packaging where you wanted so it to be? It's actually the same artist. Um, so it's a really cool story. Better for him than me. But this guy came into my factory when I had Winwood, and he said, "Can I paint one of your tables?" And uh, and I said, "Okay." So we painted a table, and that was the rabbit logo that we used. And uh, it was so damn good. And I said, "Why don't you paint that wall outside?" And the guy's like, okay, he spent a month painting this wall. It was the first mural he ever did. It had over 100,000 likes on Instagram in a day. And he took off to the fucking races. His name's Evoca One. He's a Dominican-born artist. He had an opportunity, a, 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 a contract in his hands to play professional baseball. He turned it down because he wanted to paint. And he struggled a lot. He's finally gotten on his feet and he's blown up. So he's constantly coming out top 10 street artists worldwide, left and right. Big name now. But I gave him an opportunity to, to paint on my wall. And for that, he's been very grateful. And we've developed a great friendship. And he's just gone to the moon uh, with, his, with his art, his fine art, his street art, everything. So he, uh, he's worked with me with everything I've done. He's designed all my premium labels. They're all original artwork, whether they're either paintings or drawings, sketches, charcoals, whatever you have. Um, and he's really had a hands-on uh, you know, type of position with a brand when it comes to our stylization. So he's, he's a, just a monster of a guy. Um, Right now, I think he's taking like four flights in Mexico because he's trying to save money to get from Cancun to Mexico City. But he's a fantastic guy. He's just gone. I mean, he's just gone to another level. When I met him, his paintings were going for a couple hundred dollars. Now they're going for 10 grand. So he's, he's had a tremendous run. Uh, and he's, he's young. He's about 27 years old. But he's just I mean, we wouldn't be where we were without his his input on, on a lot of things that we do. You know, little things like the color of that label isn't quite right for the for the for the shade of tobacco that you're using. That's a weird thing to say. And then he's like, oh, try putting a little coffee on it, darkening it up, and then seeing how it looks. 
put a little coffee on it, look at it, and you're like, fuck, the guy's right. So he's got one of those eyes. You know, he's an artist. He's very talented in that sense, but he's helped a lot with the design and stylization of the brand. It's um, awesome. So, so that's what we use for with it. The, the, all the JV stuff is designed in-house. My shipping guy, Danny, did Gibraltar. Jacqueline Sears, who's one foot in, one foot out. She works for us two days a week and then does private work uh, the other three days. She designed Sevillana and, uh, and uh, Murcia's uh, artwork. All of our posters, too, were made by her. So we had a rule when we started. If you worked for us, you had to be an artist or some sort of creative, as well as doing whatever we told you to do. So we had kind of an in-house design team that we didn't have to pay for when we started out, which was that's cost cool. effective. Yeah, that's cool. Um, so uh, Call Buster Girls are pretty hot. Is that uh, I know there's a lot of things that go into that, but um, you know, what do you kind of attribute that to most recently? I attribute it to sex. <laughs> and here's why. Here's why. I had this conversation two days ago, actually, and... You talk to an old-time Dominican manufacturer and you tell them that, they look at you like you're fucking crazy. But what we've been able to achieve with our brand and how it came about, I'll tell you exactly what it is. Caldwell, when you, when you look at a Caldwell box, you check it out. You look at it, you pick up the cigar, you have a romance with a cigar before you ever put it in your mouth. When you walk down the street and you see a hot chick, you check her out. You don't walk down the street and see a girl and say, damn, I bet she can cook clean, really smart, very intelligent, fun to talk to. That doesn't happen. You look at her and you look at her ass. Caldwell, you look at it, you look at the band, you look at the box. So you check our cigars out just like you would a woman. Now, if you go out on a date with that woman, it might be a one-night stand if she's no good, if, she, if she's not intelligent, if she's not sweet, if she's not fun. Something has to keep you around. So we have great packaging and we have a great product. And, and so we have what I consider to be a very cool package. That's what brings people to the table and that's what brings them coming back. I think as a company, a lot of things set us apart. We're fun, we're wild, we don't give a shit, you know? We every the amount of fuckums that happen every day from the UPS guy to this asshole that wants this or it, it's nonstop. You know, we, we don't we don't care in that sense. We're not we're not motivated by a lot of factors that other companies are. And I think that a lot of our consumership, a lot of retailers scratch their head and they're like, these guys are idiots. Um, but a lot of our consumership, I think that they feel the energy coming out of the brand and guys live the brand. And we've been able to achieve what I think a uh, few other great brands have and mind you we're not very old so but i think we've been able to kind of transcend a whole let's sell a cigar with a cool box and label type of concept and it's become somewhat of a movement and somewhat of a of an experience for people to to, to be with us and a lot of it's my team i mean i get about 40 facebook messages a day i respond every three or four days i sit down and i respond to all of them my employees do the same thing so we're not too good for anything in a year from now, when I'm getting 100,000 messages, it might be a different story, but we do take the time to engage all of our customers, at being consumers, um, you know, in the brand. Everywhere that I go, I'm like, hey, I'm in Phoenix. Jimbo's like, hey, I'm in Phoenix too. Why don't you come out and have a beer with me? Jimbo might be the weirdest fucking guy I've ever met in my life, but I'll go and I'll sit down and I'll buy the guy a beer. And so everywhere that we go, we make a, we make a solid effort to not go visit stores, not go do events but to let our consumers spend time with us. So it's, I mean, I got a guy in New York that's an awesome guy. This guy took me to his family's restaurant. He took me to his favorite bar and he showed me New York City for an afternoon. It's a great experience. You know, we, we did that in, in Georgia. We did it in North Carolina. So we allow, we allow ourselves the time in our travel schedules to connect with the, with the consumers mm -hmm. outside of cigars. And I think that they go and they tell their friends and they really get behind the brand. And, you know, I don't know. I think that we've created something that, <laughs> That it's, I don't want to say a lifestyle brand, but we've created a movement and an energy that people, that people connect with. You know, so they, what, what you're saying, Robert, is that you have a nice package, you don't give a shit, and you'll buy us a beer. Precisely. So don't you want to be my friend? <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Um, Let me know if I get long-winded because I go out on tangents. And no, no, it's fine. If no, you don't stop me, I'll start talking about fucking gummy bears, <laughs> raggedy and doll. I'll be like, I'll be like four miles away from you. But I won't come back. Too many, too many drugs. So, uh, Robert, tell us about the what's the lost and found cigar and your involvement with that. So I'm not involved with that cigar technically, but I am technically also involved in that cigar. So before I had Caldwell. My dog's fighting my girl now. This is fucking sweet. So before I had Caldwell, um, I came out with this idea by way of actually talking to Dylan Austin, which was uh, uh, kind of a thing that I that I would do. I go to I go to your factory 
and, and Camacho, I'm sorry for how many times I've done this, but I will go dig through your fucking back rooms. What is this? What is this? What is this? I like to find things. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a, a thrifter type. I like to find hidden gems. So I would do this actually for about six, seven years with Camacho. I go find something. I'm like, what is this? They're like, we have no fucking clue. Then we come back and they say, oh, that's an original SLR from 2000, whatever. A cigar that everybody wants. And it's smoking. I'm like, ah, oh, it's amazing. Take a bundle back, share them with my friends. So, so the, the concept was an original concept that I had because I stole it from Dylan. Um, and so I wanted to come up with a concept where I could go find cigars and bring them in and market them. Try selling that to a fucking retailer. Not going to work. So anyways, in the inner room, I brought back cigars from DR and, and I shared them with a guy named Tony Bellato that owns a brand called La Barba, who also owns a couple stores called Havana House in Ohio. And he's like, these are awesome. Let's sell these. So we brought them in. Cool packaging. Can't tell you the source on those. They came out of Dominican Republic. Fantastic cigars. And we sold them in a store. And it was something for me to do to pass the time before I launched Caldwell. And I thought it was fun. So I launched Caldwell. Caldwell has success. All of a sudden, these things are selling for like $500 for a 10-pack, which is not good. Makes no sense. Don't ever pay $50 for a cigar unless it's a dab at all. Mm. Um, <clears throat> $500 a cigar, right? But so, <laughs> but, but so anyways, you know, guys started going nuts for these things. So Tony called me up about four months ago and, and he said, hey, did we ship in all those pepper cream sodas? And I'm, I'm like, no. Nah. And he's like, why didn't we ship them in? I'm like, they didn't sell. And he's like, well, they're selling for $500 a pack and everybody's knocking down my door to get them because they think it's my brand because I was the one selling them. So he says, can, can I have it? And he said, can you have what? He said, can I have the brand? And I was like, there's not a brand, but you can do this if you want to do it. Under two conditions. Condition A, I get to create all the packaging and marketing material for the brand as kind of an exercise for me to, to do crazy shit that I like to do when I'm bored. And B, I get to find the fucking cigars because it's still my palate that's tied to the project and I don't want to bring in something that I don't think is respectable. And so he said yes. So it's actually his brand. It's under La Barba Cigars, uh, Tony's brand. I find the cigars and I market the cigars. So I do all the work and he makes all the money. Mm -hmm. Cool. So I what, should have never told him yes. By the way, I should have <laughs> kept that. But what do friends do? So, uh, Robert, what's next for Caldwell Cigars? Caldwell Cigars is now in a fantastic um, growth phase. So we don't have. You're not going to see anything new from us. We've been out for about 18 months. You know, there was a bit of confusion with the lost and found shit. Guys thought it was like, mm -hmm. oh, we're launching all these limited and shit. Put out a press release which half wheel wrote backwards so people still didn't understand it um but effectively you know we we, try, we have to explain our way out of that fucking thing every day we've launched nothing since we've been out we came out with a lancero eastern standard which we had already made which is part of supposed to be part of the line but it tasted so unique uh lee that we didn't want to launch it so we had cigars we brought them in limited limited production thing we did a uh we, we extended our lines recently we added a belly coso which ships next week of long live the king we added a Lonsdale to King is Dead. We added a, a Piramide and a Super Toro to Eastern Standard. So everything has five now. Um, and in addition to that, we have our limited edition. So in, in the year that we've been in business, we've added four SKUs. Or year and a year, a year and a half we've been making cigars. Year we've been in business. Um, we are going to be reworking a thing or two uh, with our existing portfolio. Uh, we're, we're in transition on a couple products, but they'll, they'll, they, it'll be Gibraltar, Murcia, Sevillana, King's Dead, Long Live King, Eastern Standard. That's our lines. Um, we do have something very interesting that we are adding. So we are adding something. Uh, we're collaborating with another factory. Um, guess which one? And uh, we're going to be producing a cigar out of Central America that, that will debut at the show. And the purpose for that is, is it's an opportunity for us to grow and reach consumership that, that is very turned away by a Dominican cigar because there's still stigma and guys are like, it's lighter. I don't smoke Dominican or whatever. So we, we're not doing a cigar in Nicaragua. We're doing it somewhere else. Uh, Toro, Robusto, 660, everyday price point, uh, 7 to $9 range, 20-count box, awesome artwork, fantastic cigars. That's going to be coming out at the show. So, so that's the one addition that we're going to have to our lines, uh, to our company this, this year. Uh, so that's what we have in the works. Uh, a lot of guys, it's funny though, a lot of guys, you know, we're still young. 
Uh, we know that we have a hot brand. We know we need to, you know, but we got to get our shit together. A lot of guys are asking us for a lot of things. Uh, I was just in DR. Um, we went from producing 80,000 cigars, which we expected to last us six months. We sold them in five weeks to now producing 100,000 cigars a month with a factory that's built to produce about 50. Hmm. So right now we're in expansion mode trying to get, you know, bigger place. Um, we, we roll all day. They pack all night. The factory is almost 24 hours. So they're doing labels. They're doing tags. They're doing stickers. They're doing quality control at night and they're rolling cigars in the day. It's a very hard way to run a factory. It's a very bad life that we're giving to our to our factory. Obviously, they're growing, but you know, so we're kind of in we're kind of in a transition phase in that sense where we're trying to, you know, you can run, 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 which we've done. Then kind of calm the fuck down. I'm gonna stop traveling a lot. I'm gonna spend a lot of time in DR, a lot of time at the factory, a lot of time, you know, paying attention to to what matters to me now. You know, I think the brand's built enough. We we we're, we're jogging now. We're not running yet, but. Uh, you know, we need to go back to square one and, and, and you can't grow. You can't you can't build a fucking high rise on a foundation that's not set in stone. You know, we're and, and so like right now we ordered. I don't know. We ordered, I think, 20,000 boxes, uh, not of cigars, but cigar boxes, empty boxes to be made through the end of the summertime. It's a tremendous amount of money for us uh, to shell out. You know, it's a lot of work, but we're, we're trying to build ourselves in that way. So that as we continue to grow, we don't end up with another backorder situation. We can continue to deliver in a timely fashion to the customers. Robert, are you ready to play five questions with the Stoey Geeks? Yes. Three words to describe yourself. Tall, blonde, female. If you were <laughs> a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? A spoon. If you wrote a book about yourself, what would the title be? Upside down. In the popular game of Ask Grabby Grabby, do you prefer to go first or second? First. Choose two celebrities to be your parents. Hmm. Can I fuck them? <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's pure fantasy, Robert, and it's your is, fantasy, so you yeah, can do what you have absolutely. complete creative freedom no, over your here. celebrity I'll, parents. I'll take, I'll take the question very seriously. Kathy Ireland, do you remember her? I do, oh, very yeah. much so, yes. I would have her be my mother, and I would have, uh, shit, I forget this guy's name. Who's the guy from Ocean's 11, 12, 13? Like the very George Clooney? Guy. Yes, he'd be my father. George Clooney. He, he consistently has always been with a woman that looks exactly like the woman before him. He never married them until recently. They were always a different nationality, but they always looked like twins. <laughs> I think that's, that's a skill set that you want to have, right? So the only way is through genetics, and I want that. <laughs> Excellent. Robert, thank you very much for appearing on the Stewie Geek Show. It's nice to have you back. Thank My you, pleasure. Robert. Really appreciate thank you. It. And stay, stay tuned. We're going to take a short break, but Robert, stay in the line. We just got something for you after this segment. Sounds good. We'll be right back. <laughs> 